So I'll mm. I'll kind of get started a little bit here, and then I'll lay out some thoughts um, and some notes that I wrote down, kind of how I started shifting a little bit how I think about marketing. Obviously, that's the kind of big overarching topic here, B two B marketing, and then we can go into into any of the connected stuff, whether it's content or branding or sales or ref ops. Obviously it's like, for me, this is an experiment. Like I, I'm thinking about doing this kind of either weekly, bi-weekly or monthly kind of on a recurring basis. Obviously I post a lot of content where I talk about all these topics and marketing and, 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 and content and all these things that kind of we focus on at project 33, but they're all kind of a little bit more generic, right? The kind of surface level, not necessarily surface level, but I, I try to say things that are a little bit more widely applicable. And so for me, like my hope is out of this to have get a little bit more granular to go a little bit more into like de details and nuances. Um, so once we get into the discussions or questions, like feel free to like get into specifics, right? Like ask questions that you wanna like have a specific answer to, specific to your situation, specific to the people that you're selling to the product that you're selling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we can see whether we, we we can make this fun. Obviously, there's not a selfless act, right? For me, like I'm hoping to just uh, build a little bit of a kind of recurring thing here, get some content ideas out of this too, just see what people are actually thinking uh, about and caring about when it comes to B2B marketing. All right, let me share some thoughts and then and then we can open it up to, to discussion. Um, so obviously we with Project 33, you know, we've been doing content and marketing for B2B companies for now three years. You know, there's bigger companies, better companies out there. I'm not pretending like I'm the, you know, source of truth when it comes to these things. Like there are many people who are, who are more, have more expertise than I have, but we have learned some things over, over the time. And, and we have seen a bunch of different companies, whether they're tech consulting agencies in the healthcare space, in the construction space. And we've seen some patterns when it comes to you know, how to, how to do good marketing, you know? And, and when I think about marketing, the way that I separate sales from marketing, um, because they are separate, they have their own departments, but people will talk about that they should be more integrated. To me, what sales is, the goal of marketing and sales is the same, it's to generate revenue. Sales is one-on-one. -on -one. So a salesperson one-on-one -on -one has a conversation with a prospect, they have a one-hour call, very specific, very detailed, very granular to that specific prospect's situation and problem. And it's one-to-one. -one. Marketing is anything that scales. So where you can do it once and it can reach multiple people. Whether it's run an ad, you produce the ad one and once, and then you run Facebook or LinkedIn or Google ads, wherever you do it. And then that same ad can reach multiple people, whether it's a podcast that you record once and then hundreds of people can all listen to the same podcast, whether it's posting something on LinkedIn where you write that post once and then hundreds of people can all read that same post. Um, you know, whether it's a banner ad or a road sign, you know, you put it up once, you write the copy for the road sign once and then hundreds of people can drive by and all get that message, right? So it's like scaled communication. And I think B2B is kind of special in the sense that when I talk about B2B, I basically mean just high price, complex products that you sell to senior decision makers, right? So they're not a $30 t-shirt. They're not an e-com business that you can, you know, self-check out on the website. And so when it comes to that, traditionally companies have done everything through sales, right? Basically the whole buying journey was serviced through an SDR, BDR, AE, just a salesperson, right? Who goes out prospecting, reaches out to a prospect, they have the first call, they have the second call, they have the third call, they bring in other decision makers and it's all one-to-one, -one, which is obviously um, expensive, right? Because you're paying like a salary for this person to spend their one-on-one -on -one time with a prospect, but it's justifiable because if you're selling expensive solutions that are, whether it's a consulting fee or whether it's an agency with retainers in the, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 per month, or whether you're selling an enterprise software, you know, where a license is 100,000 plus, you can justify spending that salary trying to get those customers, right? On the kind of B2C side, the kind of most extreme is that basically everything is done through marketing, right? The whole customer journey is done through marketing where 
if you buy a t-shirt on a website, you never talk to anyone one-on-one, -on -one, right? You only see an ad and then you see maybe another ad and then you go to the website and the website has content and descriptions and how this works and where you produce it and you know what your supply chain is or what your refund policy for that t-shirt is and someone self-checks out on the website, right? So there's no kind of sales involved. And I think the goal should always be to do as much as possible with marketing because kind of by, by definition, uh, or at least by my definition, marketing are the things that scale. And so they're by definition cheaper if you know what you're doing, right? Because if you can produce a podcast, record a video, write an ebook, produce an ad, whatever it is that actually resonates with your, with your target buyers, and you can use that hundreds and thousands of times over and over for multiple buyers, then it's much cheaper than doing everything through a one-on-one -on -one salesperson. But because we're talking B2B, you always have some involvement on sales, which is one-on-one -on -one because, you know, someone before they spend $50,000, $100,000 with you, they will always want to talk with a real person on the other side of the call. Okay, let me try to manage the comments too. Max, marketing is sales at scale. Uh, second, what if I'm the product? Will you address it? I'm not sure if I get your question, Edie, if you... I'll, I can get you on afterwards and you can just kind of frame your question here. So that's how I think about marketing and sales. That's why the goal should always do to do as much as possible off the buying journey with marketing because it's scaled. So it's cheaper. You will always have some involvement from sales. Um, if you're selling expensive products or solutions complex that are complex. Now, in terms of marketing, I do think that marketing is not new selling, you know, complex expensive products and solutions is also not new nothing of this is new but what i do think is new is that back in the day if you wanted to do marketing you only re really needed one person which is a copywriter um i don't know if you guys seen the netflix series uh, mad men it's kind of on this kind of 1970s advertising agency new york city type of world and when a company came to an advertising agency and say, hey, we want to do some, some advertising. We want to do some marketing. They basically got assigned a copywriter and an account executive. And then the copywriter would produce whatever you needed for your marketing, for your advertising, whether it writing the copy for the road sign, whether it would be writing the newspaper ad, whether it would be writing the kind of tagline that would go along, you know, a, a, a prospectus or a flyer or a one pager or whatever it is that you needed for your marketing was basically done through copywriter. Maybe you had a graphic designer who would like sketch up a little, you know, a little thing to graphically underline a little bit what you wanted to say. It was all just communication, right? And then eventually we got TV. And then if you wanted to do marketing, you wanted to do produce TV ads. Now you suddenly needed not just a copywriter, but you needed someone who could produce videos, you know, a camera person, someone who could script the ad. Um, you needed to have a person you know, who, who understood the programmatic aspect of when your ad should be shown on the TV, all these things. And now we're at a point where marketing is extremely fragmented, right? We have all these different platforms and channels and activities that we have, whether it's LinkedIn and TikTok and YouTube, and then we have SEO and we have Facebook ads and Google ads and LinkedIn ads, we have performance marketing, organic marketing. Um, and so, you have this fragmentation, which means that it's much harder to just do marketing, right? Because a lot of these different channels and a lot of these, these different activities require a different skill set. The same person who is a copywriter who might be able to write LinkedIn co content, content for you is not the same person who is a performance marketer who understand the Facebook marketing platform and can, can you know, uh, run Facebook retargeting ads. And it's not the same person who is an SEO specialist who knows exactly, you know, how to set up and create SEO content for Google that helps your website rank on Google. So it becomes much harder to kind of service these things. And so what companies started doing is you have a couple of options when you're faced with that. Either you can hire a full team, right? And you can hire the copywriter and the video editor and the performance marketer and the growth hacker and the Facebook ad specialist and the LinkedIn ad specialist and the SEO specialist and just have this full team. And I think 
once you hit scale, that's the absolute best solution to really have specialists and experts and all of these. But especially when you're starting out, you know, if you're a smaller company or medium sized companies, or you just don't have, you know, 100 million in funding and can just hire a 10, 15 people f team of full time people, you're, you're faced with different options. And generally what we see companies go for when we talk with them, and I, and I talk with a lot of founders of B2B companies, is either they stack agencies. So they find different agencies who service these different things. So they find an agency that does LinkedIn content for them. And then they find another agency who does SEO for them. And they find another agency that does Facebook ads for them. And they kind of stack these agencies over time, right? And usually they start out with the first one. And then if they're good and it actually drives revenue for them and they grow, then eventually they can add the second one. That's often a really good option, especially if you find great agencies, right? Th that actually know what they're doing and they can drive revenue and that activity starts picking up and drives growth. And then you can add the next agency and then the next agency. The problem with that is that over time that adds, com adds complexity. Now suddenly you have five agencies that you're managing that all want your time, that all want feedback on their content briefs, that all need to be reviewed and approved, um, that all need to, you know, are all on their own payroll. And they have all these different silos, right? And then you have Facebook ads that are doing things over here. And then you have some LinkedIn content going out over here. Then you have your SEO person kind of over here doing their own thing and they don't cross communicate, right? Which, which means that it's just not very efficient. Um, the second option is that they try to find a unicorn. They try to find a junior marketing person who can do all of these things that I just mentioned. And I've seen literal job description for marketing managers that look like that, where they say, we want you to have, you know, three years of experience and we want you to be able to write content and do PR campaigns and manage our Facebook ads and manage LinkedIn ads and do our SEO and, uh, you know, do Google AdWords and do all the analytics uh, and growth uh, performance kind of metrics on the back end and reporting and do all of these things, right? And it's just very hard to find that person. Because again, they're just so fragmented that these are different skill sets nowadays. You just don't find all of these things in the same person, or it's just very rare. Or when you find it, they're not going to work for manager salary for you. They're, you know, they're they're going to be head of marketing salary or something like that, which you just can't afford in the beginning. Or you do it yourself, right? And that's that's what most founders do, and that's usually the best option. You know, you just take it into your own hand to post some content on LinkedIn and to send out an email newsletter whenever you remember and to add some blog posts on your website uh, that you wrote up and teach yourself Facebook ads on the weekends, right? That, that's what founders do. And that's that often is the best option because it's one is the cheapest. And especially when you as the founder have a knack for marketing, you understand marketing and you have the business at a point where you can actually focus on these things and you can take the time to post on LinkedIn and, you know, maybe record a podcast every now and then and create some blog posts and do all these different things. And it's a great option. Problem is what we see it often takes on this kind of on and off activity, right? Because there, there will always be like fires and priorities going on in the business. And then, you know, you do this for a while and you focus on it and then some fire happens that you need to put out. And then there's no LinkedIn content going out for some weeks and there's no newsletter going out for a couple months. And, you know, and then eventually you solve that thing and focus on that thing and then you pick it back up again. And so it's this, there's no consistency. And so I think for B2B companies who sell expensive, complex products, it's really important to try to use marketing, right? To have the scalable aspect to their communication, to how they create awareness and build trust in the market and explain what they do and how they do it. Um, is really important. Um, and so the main goal in the beginning is to repurpose, right? To create content, to create pillar pieces of content that where you can showcase your, your subject matter expertise, where you can explain what you do and how you do it, where you can, you know, give advice and tips to the people that you're selling to, um, to show that you actually know what you're talking about, that you are an expert and focus on one activity. And I think the, the main that main two that I see make the most sense is either creating a podcast. I think a lot of companies have found success with that. They create a weekly to monthly podcast where it's 
subject matter expert, and usually that's the founder in the podcast talking. Sometimes you can have guests, sometimes you can have interviews, sometimes it's just solo you, the founder, talking about your lessons and your learnings and your advice and and you know your product and all these things. Um, and then you put out that podcast and then you repurpose it, right? So then you clip the, the podcast into separate videos, you turn it into separate LinkedIn posts, you have someone transcribing the podcast, adding it to your website to add content there um, and just really build out a process how you, instead of having all of these different silos where there's like a LinkedIn content that only goes on LinkedIn and then Facebook ads that only are being used in your Facebook ads and then YouTube videos that only go out on your YouTube and nowhere else, you overlap, right? You create a pillar piece of content, whether that's a podcast, whether those are videos that we produce for ourselves and customers, and then use them in multiple channels to, to service these, these needs, this communication need to, to, as I said, build trust, build awareness, explain what you do and how, um, showcase that you know what you're talking about and all these different things. Those were kind of a couple of thoughts. Curious if uh, either any questions. So I see there's one question, Kunal. So is it better to start off with using a small marketing agency than hire own? I think it just really depends. We, you know, I, I talk with founders and oftentimes I talk with founders who are not necessarily marketing people, right? Because founders always have a persona. They're either that marketing person or they're that salesperson or they're the product person, the technical person. They have a background where they're coming from. Right? And we often talk with the founders who, who, who don't have this natural kind of knack for marketing. They're either a product person or the technical person or they're a salesperson. And they know how to one-on-one -on -one talk with people, but not so much marketing, right? And so it's not so much about do you do this activity or not? It's about how you do it, right? So it's not about do you put blog posts on your website or not, or do you post on LinkedIn or not, uh, or do you run Facebook ads or not? It's how do you do these things, right? Because you can either do them really well or you can do them really shittily. And just doing something doesn't lead to anything, right? You need to put out great blog posts on your website. You need to have great Facebook ads. You need to have great LinkedIn content for any of this to actually have an impact. Right. And so then I think it's just about one self-awareness, like, are you able to do this in a way that's good, uh, you know, where you uh, find the time where you can focus on it, where you have the knowledge and expertise, where you do have that kind of knack for marketing. So you have some intuition around kind of what things people will care about and what will catch attention and what headlines will convert and what, you know, how to say things and you know, do you have this intuition? If you do, I think it's great. And then I think the best thing is to first just focus on one channel, um, probably LinkedIn, create content around that and then figure out how to repurpose it. If you don't, if you don't have that natural kind of ability, then I think it's about finding an agency or a freelancer or whatever it is that can, that can help you with it or hiring that first person. But then again, it's about validating that that they know what they're doing, right? Because there's lots of agencies out there who, who go through the motion, but it's just not doing anything, right? Like I literally talked with a prospect last week and uh, he, he told me that they're already working with a LinkedIn agency, right? He saw us as a LinkedIn agency. And so he said, yeah, well, we already have our LinkedIn agency. And I asked him what they do for him. And he explained that he's paying them $3,000 per month. I think it's Canadian dollars. I don't know what's that in US dollars or euros. I'm guessing it's roughly equal. He's paying them $3,000 Canadian dollars per month. And what they're doing is that they're posting five times a week on his company's LinkedIn page, third-party blog posts that they're sourcing from news outlets like Forbes and uh, Business Wire. And I don't know what, what all these... So there, there, this this prospect was in a certain niche, and so this agency is helping them, helping them find blog posts from other people. So they're not writing any content; they're just sourcing this, and then basically just publishing the link to that blog post on his company LinkedIn page, which is crazy. Obviously, this is not working, right? Because one, LinkedIn doesn't like outbound links, 
right? So this this content is getting literally zero engagement, like one like, two likes. Two, it just it doesn't build any any trust and any any credibility for him. Because even if they find a great Forbes article somehow that's like really interesting, and someone might click on it because his company page posted this, they're not suddenly gonna, you know, believe that his solution or his service is somehow better, right? Maybe it's helping a little bit to stay top of mind and just showing that like you exist, but that's really the only thing. Is that worth paying 3000 Canadian dollars for? I would say no. So, right. It's, it's not about what you do is how you do it. So like, I guess my long answer to the question, it just comes down to self-awareness. Have, do you have that knack? And if you don't like source a good freelancer agency or hiring someone junior to do it for you. But again, you need to be able to evaluate whether they know what they're doing or are they just going to go through the motion and publish some Forbes article on your on your LinkedIn page for you? If the focus is B2B, should you only do LinkedIn or does it make sense to post on other platforms? I think it depends because obviously B2B is a big thing, right? So it really depends on, on where you are. Like we, we work with a construction company at some point. They sell to kind of like schools and universities and they help them with waterproofing. So one one very specific part of the construction process is what they do, waterproofing, um, making sure that the building is waterproof, right? And so we talked with him and he said, well, the, the, the people, you know, who, who sign off on the deal, the people who have the budget are kind of owners and founders and CEOs of these, these development uh, companies. And so we said, okay, are these people on LinkedIn? And he said, yes. And so we started posting on LinkedIn. And then only later we realized that the way that buying works for this particular company was that it was oftentimes the, the, the project managers or the superintendents on the construction side who sourced and made the decision on the waterproofing, right? It's the people who are on that construction side 24 seven, you know, and then at some point they're like, oh, we need waterproofing. All right. Who do you know? And then they are the person who just then kind of pushes the paper to the to the owner or the CEO or whatever that title is, and they just sign up on the deal. But the person who actually drives the kind of buying decision bottom up was the superintendent, and they're not on LinkedIn. Like they, you you could see when you use Sales Navigator that these people might have a LinkedIn account, but they're just not active on LinkedIn. Um, and so on this point, we said, you know, it just doesn't really make sense to be really active on LinkedIn here. Like this is just not the channel. So I think it just comes down where do your buyers actually spend time? I think for, you know, I don't know, like 80% of B2B companies, it is LinkedIn. Um, but these people spend time on other platforms, right? They're, they're normal people. They probably spend time on YouTube. They probably spend time on Instagram after work. Uh, they, they probably listen to podcasts. They probably scroll Twitter every now and then. So, you know, it's just about finding where do they hang out? And then focusing on that, I think LinkedIn is, is probably the ones that makes the most sense to focus on for most B2B companies. I think you always want to have that, have your, your best performing content on your website, because a lot of people will not go through LinkedIn and then from LinkedIn, click on your website and then just book a call. A lot of them will, you know, maybe forward your stuff to someone or they'll tell someone like, Hey, I've heard about this company, Project 33, you should check them out. And then they'll Google your name and go to your website. And then if there's just a, you know, empty shell of a website um, with no, no content, no kind of insights, nothing to showcase that you, you've done this, you've been there, um, you, you know, you know what you're talking about, then, uh, you know, we, we publish our content on LinkedIn. We also have a YouTube channel that's actually now starting to pick up actual SEO, uh, which is really interesting. You know, we've we've been posting on LinkedIn for two years now every week because all of my videos and all of Jay's videos go out on our LinkedIn, uh, on, on our YouTube. LinkedIn is by far the, the, the most effective platform for us. Um, so we kind of just put them there to have them there, to have like this kind of content library in a sense where I can send out the links to people if they need certain videos. And now we're actually starting to get organic reach. Like people are actually starting to search for things in YouTube and our videos are starting to pop up. So I think there's also long-term, we are adding all of our, our best videos to our website and same thing is happening there. 
We've been adding our videos for two years onto our website. We have, I think, 150 videos on our resources page, all about content marketing, marketing, sales, LinkedIn, personal branding, you know, copywriting, all these things that we talk about. And so far, it was only for us, not so much as an organic channel. It was just that once someone lands on our website, whether they come from LinkedIn or through word of mouth or through something else or through a cold email, once they land on our website, that we can show that we know what we're talking about. Right, that we don't just say, hey, we kind of have an understanding of, of marketing, but that we have, you know, 150 videos to back up kind of our knowledge and, and our thinking and our philosophy on things. Um, and only now, like a couple of months back, it actually started to, to pick up SEO. Like when people Google seven hour, hour rule, I think we show up on the first page. When people Google LinkedIn hooks, uh, I think we show up on the first page. When people search how to post on LinkedIn, we're starting to rank, not on the first page, somewhere later, right? Like we're starting to actually rank for some of these, these keywords. Um, so it is interesting. And there is short-term and long-term, I guess, a long-winded answer. Is personal team-oriented content suitable for B2B or should it be strict focus on the solution you're offering? Personal content. Um, so obviously I post a lot of personal content, um, you know, about my travels and the books that I read and, and getting married and this and that. And um, that's just kind of where I come from because, you know, that's how I started out. Like in the beginning, I had zero expertise. So it was just all personal. It was all just documenting my journey. Um and, you know, I like talking about these things and I have gained friends through that. I have gained, you know, lots of feedback and, you know, book recommendations on all of through this stuff. So I enjoy it um, for our customers. Um, we have four content pillars. So we break down their content into four buckets. Um, the first one is problem and solution content. So this is just anything that explains your specific solution. How does it work? What's your process? What are your features? You know, what are the different benefits from all the different features? What's your pricing? Why is your pricing this way? How do you structure your deal? What's your onboarding like? You know, why do you do things in this way and not that way? How do you compare to this competitor and to that alternative, right? Like all the things that once someone is already aware of you and they are starting to consider you, th those questions that they usually ask on sales calls. So this is problem and solution content. We sometimes call it insider funnel content. Then we have the second one is SME, subject matter expertise. So this is the things that you want to be known for as an expert. And ideally, you, you are an expert in these things, whether those things are marketing or sales or websites or design or, you know, healthcare or, you know, waterproofing or whatever the thing that people come to you for to, you know, pay you money that's subject matter expertise. So this content is more, not so much aimed at just purely the people who are already considering buying your specific solution, but just anyone in the market who is dealing with the general problems and pain points that you are solving, right? So this is kind of advice and insights and strategies and tips and tricks and how to's and, you know, so that's subject matter expertise. Then the third one is company content. So company is anything about your company in general, you know, your growth, new hires, opening a new office, you know, oh, we just raised a new funding round. Oh, we just, you know, got acquired by this company, you know, oh, here's a picture of our company offside, you know, team meeting, blah, 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 right? To just kind of your company, your culture, your mission, your founding story, like all the things kind of general about your company. And then number four is personal. And this is really just personal to that person that is creating that content what do you do in your free time you know what what books have you recently read you know what what side projects are you working on what insights do you have you know how do you think about family you know stories about travels and adventures and hikes that you went down pictures of you know you and you know i don't know your kid and your wife and you know and it is part of the mix for us personally, the way that we break down these four buckets that I just explained for customers in terms of percentage is problem and solution is 25%. Subject matter expertise is 50%. 
and then the remaining 25% is split between this company and this personal content. So 12 and a half percent and 12 and a half percent, right? So this means one in eight, right? So when we create content for customers, two out of eight will be on their problem and solution. Four out of eight will be subject matter expertise, giving strategies, insights, advice for free. And then one out of eight will be around the company in general. And then one out of eight will be personal. And um, we do get pushback sometimes from, from our customers, from founders, you know, where they say, no one cares about what I do in my free time. No one cares about what books I'm reading. No one cares about, you know, that I just traveled to this place and that I saw this amazing sunset. And no one cares about that my role model is, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Angela Merkel or whatever. No one cares about these things and especially not our buyers. And the funny thing is that once you start doing this, you do realize that, yes, they do. You know, people do care about these things. Now, when you, when you create this personal content, you still want to add value, right? There's a difference between posting a picture of your lunch and saying, here's what I had for lunch. No one cares about that. And posting a picture of your lunch and saying, here's what I recently, you know, I just recently got started with cooking. I took a cooking class. You know, I looked around for a while. This is my favorite cooking class. They really have some great advice. I'm trying to reduce my gluten intake for whatever reason. And here's a recipe that I found that really helps me stay focused and, and be productive and be happy and taste really good. And it's very easy to make. And here's the recipe, by the way, right? Like this is personal. This has nothing to do with your solution and what you're selling and, and all of these things, but it still adds value, right? It's still not just a plain kind of like, Look at me. Um, and so the, the way that I explain it to my, our customers always when they ask or, or push back on this is when you have a sales call, a sales conversation with someone, almost everyone naturally in the first five minutes does small talk, right? When you have a sales call with someone, you talk with them for the first time ever. They don't know you. You have never met them. You don't say, hey, by the way, here's our product. Here's the features. Here's, you know, you first just get to know them a little bit, right? You say, hey, where are you, where are you calling from? Oh, you're in Canada. Oh, yeah, I've been to Canada. I love Canada. What do you think about the winter? It's pretty dark there. Uh, what do we see in the background there? You love reading books. What's your favorite book? Oh, yeah, I've read that book too, right? Like you do small talk. Why do we do that? Because one, it's just, warms up the conversation it makes us feel more familiar and two the goal is to find some level of familiarity right where you can find some you know something that somehow connects you maybe you both love reading maybe you both went traveling to canada maybe you both you know played golf once maybe you are both married maybe you both have kids maybe you both you know have lived in this part of the world before you know you try to find something that 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 you can connect with over and that builds trust, right? Because we trust people who are familiar to us. And so that's where we do small talk when we have sales conversations. Now the small talk should be, you know, the first five minutes and then the rest should be about, you know, what service you can provide and how it works and your case studies and what you've done before. It shouldn't be, you know, three quarters of the call. That's a little excessive. And that's how we think about personal content, right? And that's why you should have some but it shouldn't be, you know, 80% of your content is all about, you know, this uh, beautiful sunsets and this food that you're eating recently. Um, because it's nice to build awareness, but in the end, if someone spends $50,000 on your solution or service, they, they have to like you, uh, but they also need to see that you can actually, you know, provide a good service and that you know what you're doing and that it works and that the features, you know, make sense and that it integrates with what they're currently doing and all these, all these other things, right? Do you see changes in LinkedIn organic reach at the moment? I guess I'm, I'm different in this from maybe some other people who are active on LinkedIn. I don't really look at these things. Like sometimes I see posts by, you know, LinkedIn experts, you know, people who, LinkedIn specialists, people who spend all their time on LinkedIn and who post LinkedIn content on LinkedIn, who create specifically only LinkedIn content for customers. Um, 
where they talk about, oh, videos are underperforming or reach is going down and, you know, the algorithm changed in this way and the algorithm changed in that way. I don't really pay attention to that so much. I think for me, it's more about making sure that we're communicating the things that we want to communicate, um, that we're improving our product and service, um, that I have some direct interaction with our customers and prospects, and I fold that into our content strategy. So, you know, this is one part of it, like getting actual questions from you guys will help me figure out what people actually care about, like what questions do they actually have versus what do I think people care about? And then I do the same with, with customers and with prospects, right? Whenever the prospect asks me a question on a sales call, I write it down and chances are high that it's going to be turned into a video for me. Same with customers, right? When a customer comes to us and they say, hey, I don't understand this thing. Why does this work? Why does this not work? You know, I write it down and we create content around it. So, um, and then we, we repurpose our content in many places, right? So LinkedIn is one of the channels that we do and it's definitely one of the more important ones. Um, it is losing kind of its predominance for us. Like in the beginning, it was basically 100% LinkedIn. Like anyone who work with us came through LinkedIn. Um, at this point, I would say, I do have to look at our data again. I would say it is probably still the most important one, but maybe 50% of our customers and prospects and sales conversations now come through LinkedIn and the rest come through cold email, come through the SEO, both Google and YouTube, and come through referrals and, and introductions from from existing customers. So I guess this was a long winded answer to tell you, I don't know. I really don't pay much attention to, um, you know, what's the organic reach of the day on LinkedIn. Last question I see here that I haven't answered yet from Mateos. I love your questions, Mateos. Uh, our corporate podcast really a good channel for marketing. I think it, it again comes down to what I said earlier. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. I think it just putting out a podcast will not do anything for you just as just writing blog posts or just posting stuff on LinkedIn will not do anything for you. It's how do you do the podcast? Like what's in the podcast? How do you produce it? Is it interesting? Is it actually adding value? Have you done your homework of figuring out what topics and questions and problems your buyers, the people that you're selling to are actually dealing with on their day to day? And do you have the expertise and the, the insight to actually address these things. If you have those two things, if you do know what your customers and prospects care about, and you do have the, the expertise uh, and knowledge to actually address them and, and say something insightful and useful and applicable and practical uh, on those things, on those problems and questions, uh, then I think, yeah, it's a, it's a great... It's a great place. Again, you want to, I don't, you put the corporate in there. So I'm assuming like corporate to me always means like not done well. <laughs> so, so I, I think the, the main ingredient for a good podcast, and that's the same for all other marketing is you need someone who is actually an expert at the core. If this is some marketing manager doing this podcast you know, talking about some surface level things, then no, it's not going to do anything for you. If you have your founder and CEO who build a product and, and all these things, then yeah, I think it can be a great vehicle to, to reach people. Um, I did start noticing that I'm actually starting, and I'm curious if this is different for you guys. Uh, until very recently, I only really listened to podcasts that like a very short list of podcasts and very specific ones that I would listen to over and over again. You know, the Lex Friedman podcast is one of my favorites. Tim Ferriss podcast is great. And I would just kind of see if they have any interesting guests and that's the ones that I would listen to. Um, and then slowly over time, maybe there's new being added just based on kind of recommendations. Um, I started noticing that for the first time ever in my life, I searched on Spotify for a specific topic. Um, I never did that before. I think it was, I think it was a couple months ago when the recession kind of started to hit and there was talk about the recession and all these things. And I wanted to find content from experienced 
founders and CEOs who have been through a recession before and just learn from them kind of what takeaways they have, just in general, like what adaptations, what changes did they have to make last time they went through a recession? And I searched on YouTube and I didn't really find anything. There's a great podcast by YC Combina y Combinator. There's another great podcast or video by Justin Khan, who's the previous or the founder of, of Twitch. Um, and that was it. The rest was just like bullshit videos by like random people who didn't really seem to be qualified. And so for the first time ever, I specifically went to Spotify to this podcast section and I, and I searched for kind of, I don't know what exact search term I put in, but recession marketing or recession, what changes to make in a recession, business during recession or something like that. And searching for podcasts. And so I think this is starting to going to become more prevalent where there's actually going to be organic kind of like SEO, whether it's Google SEO, YouTube SEO, there will be Spotify SEO and podcast SEO. Um, we started doing a podcast two months ago for that reason. And we are actually getting some, some organic hits um, to our podcast. We're not promoting it. And so, you know, it's like five clicks or whatever. Like it's not much like until it actually generates customers is going to take a while but there's actually people who put in some search term whether it was like linkedin uh, one of the things was performance marketing versus content marketing we have these search terms in there because that's the exact topics that we talk about they're in the headline they're in the description and we actually got a couple of organic hits to our podcast right so i think um yeah i guess that's i'm very rambly so th those are my general thoughts on the on podcasts, I guess. Um, but again, it just comes down how you do it, not whether whether or not you do it. Uh, thank you guys for joining. This was fun. Maybe see you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for listening to this episode. 